My name is David Bagley. I'm an audiologist by background and I work as a professor of hearing sciences at the University of Nottingham. My research is looking at people who've had platinum chemotherapy and end up with problems with hearing and with tinnitus and balance as a result of that. So that's very specific, but actually really rather common. About 40% of men that have testicular cancer and have platinum chemotherapy end up with either a hearing loss or with tinnitus. Now that didn't used to matter in the days when cancer treatment wasn't curative and people weren't surviving, but these days people do survive and they survive sometimes with a head full of noise. Now this feels to me that it's something that we ought to investigate and potentially that we ought to protect people against. One of the things I'm interested in is looking at very particular specific tinnitus experiences, really going deep in understanding them and then maybe generalizing into the wider tinnitus problem. And I think very often with tinnitus, we've started with the wider problem and then tried to go specific. And I'm wondering if that's the wrong way around. So I'm looking at this very specific group of people who have these particular uh, chemotherapy drugs and have tinnitus experiences afterwards. Why do they have it? Well, we don't yet know. So that will tell us something about the mechanisms in the cochlea and the hearing brain that instigate tinnitus. When in the chemotherapy journey do people get it? We don't yet know. And that might tell us something about the cumulative impact of the drugs. How many people have tinnitus during a chemotherapy journey and then it disappears once they're finished? We don't yet know. And that's very important as we journey with people through their chemotherapy so we can give them really good advice about whether this is a permanent problem or not. And then the people who do have it as a permanent problem, let's get them directly into systems where we can care for them, we can provide hearing aids if they're needed, other support if it's needed, and reclaim their quality of life. Certainly an early outcome would be that everybody who has one of these drugs gets a hearing test before and after and is asked about tinnitus. Secondly, I'm wanting to look at some of the experiences of young people who had cancer as a child and has these drugs and allow them living as adolescents and young people, perhaps with hearing loss and tinnitus, that hasn't been taken quite so seriously. But the long-term goal has to be to try and protect the cochlea. Now at the moment, any drug that you use to try and prevent the hearing loss and the tinnitus protects the tumour, the cancer, as well as protecting the inner ear. So we have to find drugs that simply protect the inner ear and leave the chemotherapy to affect the tumour. Now that might be drugs that are local to the ear, or it might be drugs that are given at a very specific time when the ear is likely to be affected. Drugs based on sulphur, particularly sodium thiosulfate, look to be the most likely candidate drugs. This is not impossible. And there are studies that have looked at this in childhood cancer with these drugs, and uh, there does seem to be some beneficial effect. So th things are on the turn. Interestingly, the big drug companies are already involved in this. So it isn't like wider tinnitus, where you've got to get the companies interested for a start off. But the other problems remain with outcome measures and uh, biomarkers for tinnitus, which we don't yet have. We're still based on subjective reports, which is a big problem in drug, drug work. What's urgently needed is some kind of objective measure of somebody's tinnitus during treatment, particularly with drug work. Now, people are urgently and uh, very committedly researching this. Some people are looking at neuroimaging to see if we can capture the tinnitus within the brain. Other people are looking at the size of your pupil, which seems to be a marker of the burden of tinnitus on your concentration. Some interesting work being done around the world on that. So these things are not impossible, but they're going to take a bit of work to get it right. One of the advantages of having been in this field for quite a long time 
is that I've got a good memory. And I can remember when, if you held a tinnitus research conference, you'd get about five people, all of whom knew each other already, and some of whom were very strong rivals. So it's really exciting to be at a meeting like the TRI meeting, 450 people, 30 different countries, and a real spirit of collaboration. Now that can only work in our favor. And it really has to go right to the heart of this community that understand that people want work that both improves current treatments, but actually doesn't lose sight of the need for a cure. And we have to hold those two things in balance. That's sometimes difficult. And I know the people who are desperate for a cure are impatient and urgent in that regard. We also have to look at optimizing present treatments and making sure that people can get them. I work in the UK, I work clinically, and some people that I see have been trying for years to get somebody to look at their tinnitus, to take them seriously, and to treat them or to treat the burden that they have. And that's heartbreaking that even in 2019, that's the case. So access to effective services, but let's not lose sight of the need for a cure. There are problems with knowing where tinnitus research is going to go. There's a very famous story told by a psychologist called Isenck. And he says, imagine that you're walking home on a dark night and you see a drunk person looking for their keys under a lamppost. And you're a kind person and you stop and try and help them. And you look around and around, they're nowhere to be seen. So you say to the person, look, where exactly were you when you lost your keys? And the person says, over there in the dark. Well, why, why are we looking under the lamppost? He said, yeah, but I can see here. And I couldn't see over there. And very often with tinnitus research, what we've been doing is been looking where we can see. And we've not been looking in the dark. One of the things that's exciting now is people are starting to use some very innovative, unusual techniques to try and improve tinnitus situations. And whilst many of those, I am sure, will be proven not to be helpful, some of them might be. And we won't find that out unless we look. One of the innovative approaches that I've been watching is the EMDR uh, reprogramming work, which has got a good evidence base for trauma. I can't see how it works, but I am assured it does work. And some of the interesting work that came out of the study by John Phillips in uh, Norwich in the UK and another study that's going on, I believe, in Belgium, uh, uh, hold very interesting prospects, perhaps, for helping people. It may turn out not to be helpful, but unless we try, we won't get anywhere. I'm really encouraged that there's a huge spirit of collaboration evident in the tennis community at the moment, and that looks to be persisting. I'm the president of the British Tinnitus Association and the BTA is talking to Tinnitus Hub and talking to the American Tinnitus Association. So the charities and funders are collaborating, but so are the researchers. The real spirit of uh, grown-up intelligent conversation going on around. And this meeting, I've taken the opportunity to talk to a researcher from the Netherlands and she and I are collaborating on some data that's been collected in Western Australia, the Busselton Health Study. It's got really good questions in it about hearing and tinnitus and questions about mental health and general physical health and emotional health. So a real spirit of international collaboration. Patients sometimes say, why on earth is it taking this long? And I'd really want to testify to the fact that many of us are using our time, energy, creativity, the whole of our working and often personal lives trying to get on top of this. Now, in my view, it never was going to be me curing this with my laptop at nine o'clock on the kitchen table on a Tuesday night. It was going to need big pharma, big universities interested, big commitment, and we're getting there with that. But these things do take time. 
but we're on it. As I'm talking today, it is a lovely Saturday morning and I'm here in Taiwan spending time and energy really trying to get to grips with this problem with 450 other people. Uh, we're on the case. We are really working hard on this.